Chaos was the law of nature. Order was the dream of man. Henry Adams There are many things that people use to label themselves. Political parties, religions, Starcraft race. We don't, however, label ourselves with our philosophies. Sure, some of those things that I mentioned contain elements of how we view the world and interact with it, but we don't generally declare our stance on philosophies directly. Dungeons & Dragons imagines a world where you do. Well, actually it steals the idea from Michael Moorcock. Of course, everyone stole from Michael Moorcock. He and Tolkien could probably sue 80% of fantasy literature at this point, and if you get nothing else from this video, please read some Michael Moorcock. You will understand where these things come from. In 1974, Dungeons and Dragons is released, and within the pages of Men and Magic, it simply states that your character needs to have a stance on the issues of law, neutrality, and chaos. There was no further explanation, aside from this table, that shows where certain people and creatures would find themselves on that spectrum. Assuming you have never read any of Michael Moorcock's work, you are unfamiliar with the Immortal Champions series, and if I were to say Three Hearts and Three Lions, your mind tries to figure out what marshmallow breakfast cereal I am referring to. Well, this provides nothing of the basis to make your choice. Your natural inclination would just be to go with law, as it seems to be the default. Most players never played with just three points of alignment. Nowadays, tabletop internet culture loves spreading around the nine square alignment tables with characters from fiction that they feel fit into these boxes. They travel along the axis of good and evil, law and chaos, but I would argue that one of those is a false axis. And we would serve our game well by reverting back to the old ways. Because I don't think of alignment as a spectrum. I view it as a religion. Foundations of Alignment When Gary Gygax wrote the initial three alignments, he really didn't think through it that much. He knew he wrote it poorly, and wrote an entire article in 1976 trying to fix the problems with the ambiguity. In my opinion, it didn't help. Gygax was known for using language that was verbose and unclear. As someone who was trained in legal writing, which should be efficient and must be clear above all else, it makes me cringe. But considering the origins of the concepts he was trying to use, Gygax is not where you should get the real scoop on things. That, as previously mentioned, is Michael Moorcock. Now, I understand the concepts of the world being separated into two camps, chaos and law, it may not have been birthed by Mr. Moorcock's brain. The concepts of order and chaos are as old as civilization. But what we understand as the dichotomy of the two in the fantasy milieu, especially in Dungeons and Dragons, is based on Moorcock's work. So what did the author have to say about it? I was asked if my use of the forces of law and chaos was not, after all, merely another version of Tolkien's or Howard's good and evil. I replied emphatically, I use the ideas of law and chaos precisely because I am suspicious of simplistic notions of good and evil. In my multiverse, law and chaos are both legitimate ways of interpreting and defining experience. Ideally, the cosmic balance keeps both sides in equilibrium. When the scales dip too far towards law, we move towards rigid orthodoxy and social sterility, a form of decadence. When chaos is uppermost, we move too far towards undisciplined and destructive creativity. So that is the axis we are actually referring to. The spectrum between ultimate order and ultimate chaos. Neither is feasible or practical in the real world. Both are manifested in beings known respectively as the Lords of Chaos and the Lords of Law. These are godlike beings who struggle against each other so that their cosmic side wins. They are practically, and literally, the gods of the multiverse. They are worshipped, prayed to, and meddle in the lives of people like the gods of our own myths. Your perception of whether the lords of law or chaos are good or evil, respectively, is likely dependent upon your own cultural 
moral, and ethical upbringing. Law and Chaos, Good and Evil Looking back at the chart that Gygax provides, you can see where people would conflate law with goodness. Even Gygax saw the issue there, and added the axis of good and evil in subsequent editions of the game to show the separation of the four concepts. While I understand why he wanted to add this axis, I think the problems that people have with alignment all stem from this axis. It comes down to moral relativism and the mechanics of good and evil in Dungeons & Dragons. Mechanically, you can see how problems would arise from players being able to suss out whether a person was good or evil. Let's say you're running a murder mystery game, and the players could just cast a spell and see who is evil in the room. Or you present a charismatic NPC that wants to hire the party for a job. But with that same spell, they can figure out if they are employed by an evil patron. What could be a fun adventure or a plot-twisting surprise turns into a dull affair where a blinking neon sign appears above the NPCs, flashing, EVIL! 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 Then there is the question of what is good or evil. Moral relativism is the idea that different cultures, different people, can view an identical course of action in an identical situation with an identical outcome as different in a moral sense. For instance, the death penalty. Some people say that it is never okay to take the life of a person. It is never justice. Personally, I'm opposed to the death penalty. But it is easy to find examples of people committing heinous crimes that put that stance to the test. But then again, it is also easy to find people in this world who view it as morally just to allow capital punishment in cases far less severe than the current laws of the United States would allow. We are each the arbiters of our own moral judgment. So what is good or evil is in the eye of the beholder. Now, this is not to say you can rationalize anything as good, though my attorney brain does say that you can rationalize anything as good. But I would argue no one is pure evil. Nearly everyone is a hero in their own mind. Most people who engage in evil acts rationalize them in their minds as for the greater good. The greater good. That doesn't justify their actions, but it doesn't present the antagonist of your adventure as a mustache-twirling villain who engages in villainy. Villainously. Villainously? To me, it is a little odd to conceptualize a being of pure evil for evil's sake. Even Luciferian stories deal with themes of rebellion and defiance. The best of those, in my opinion, frame Lucifer's fall as one caused by his disobedience to God because of his compassion towards man. So, as odd as this sounds, the concept that Tiamat is an evil god of dragons doesn't make sense to me. Pledging yourself to evil is strange nonsense. It is all based on your point of view, much like actual philosophy and religion in the real world. You may think that this eliminates the evil cult entirely, but it really does not, because it's all a matter of interpretation. What we can use from modern religions. So if you boil it down, the Amish and Joel Olstein are part of the same religion. It seems odd to think about. And they are members of different sects, to be sure. Wildly different interpretations of the same religion, true. But still, the same religion. We understand that a million people can read the same book and take a million different interpretations of it. We see it in every faith in the world. We see it inside of every sect within those religions. Name a religion or a sect or a denomination of any real size where everyone believes the exact same thing. They don't exist. The real world doesn't operate like that. So reality evades simplicity. Name any religion and to me, it will evoke different conflicting emotions. You may view something like Buddhism as a bunch of peaceful monks living in harmony with the world. But you should also include in your mind an image of the Buddhist majority exterminating a Muslim minority in Myanmar. You may counter that by saying that they're not practicing real Buddhism. But who is the arbiter of what is or is not real Buddhism? Are the Amish more or less authentic than the evangelicals? Who on earth has the authority to say? In the same way, I see alignment as interpretation. 
Some may see Tiamat as a god of lawlessness, where only the strong survive and might makes right. She could be interpreted as a god of freedom, individualism, self-sufficiency. Only those strong enough to help themselves can help others. Tiamat cannot stand servitude or slavery. She has five heads, none of which are in charge. They work together. Community over laws. No rulers, no rules. Just cooperation. Bahamut is a god of laws. Some would interpret that as peace, unity, a society not based on whims, but the rules to follow. Crime is not tolerated. Everyone has a place. But it can also be interpreted as a maker of chains. Heavily regulated society where everyone should know their place and stay there. Rulers are forged to be rulers, above the petty squabbles of commoners. Obedience begets peace. And I have individual NPCs, sects, and societies that hold these alignments and interpret them in very different fashions. I see some people trying to come up with a specific way that a chaotic society would function. That to me is a little limiting. That is merely a single interpretation on how it could function. One could state that a chaotic society is one where the strong lead, but a chaotic society could be a democracy. No rulers, no rules, because rules create loopholes. So society itself judges what is moral or ethical in their groups. There is no rule that states murder is illegal, but if an unjust murder happens, a society can deal with it. If the society feels that the murder is justified, no action has to take place. Devils are lawful, as are the followers of Pelor. Corallon Lorinthian's followers are chaotic, so are demons. They just interpret those things differently. One of my favorite NPCs in my home game is a dragonborn cleric of Tiamat. When the party found him, they were wary. This group of old school players who knew who Tiamat was and had their own interpretations of her. But the Dragonborn didn't refer to her as evil. He called her Our Lady of Freedom, Breaker of Chains. Can you tell I was in the Game of Thrones? He lived a life of servitude to Bahamut as a knight before. That life was destroyed and he felt his god had failed him. A new ruler took the place of the one he served, and he realized, to him, the fight to preserve one king over another was fruitless. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. So he discarded rulers, discarded his faith, discarded his alignment, and adopted a new one. But even so, old habits die hard, and he did things contrary to his new alignment sometimes. His alignment and his faith were his goals, but not always his outcomes. So think about this before you discard alignment. Moorcock and original D&D &D have lessons for us still. So maybe you don't need to throw away alignment. Just throw away the way you think about alignment. If you found this helpful, please be sure to like the video. This channel spreads purely by word of mouth, so it is helpful when you share it, retweet it, and spread it around social media. For more content like this, please be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon so that you're notified when a new video drops, which is about every other Friday. I love engaging with you folks in the comment section below. Please be friendly down there. If you have a suggestion for a future video, let me know. And as always, roll dice, roll play, and roll with it.